Good afternoon. Let's get started. Welcome back to campus. Hope your spring semester is off to a very good start. Are there any new folks that have not attended one of these before? Anybody here that has not been here before? Well, welcome. And let me, let me give you a brief overview of what this is. This is a weekly speaker series on energy. This is called the UT Energy Symposium. We bring in speakers who are experts in their fields every week from the industry, academia, and the government to talk about a whole range of energy issues of global importance. And the theme this semester is on energy innovation. So we'll have several speakers, including our speaker today, talk about drivers for innovation, uh, how to unlock the innovation potential of countries and across uh, different scales, uh, and also how to think about investment in uh, innovation. Uh, next week, we don't have a speaker. It's actually the UT uh, Energy Symposium Open Energy House. So it's, it will be a lot of faculty and staff, uh, students. It will be a chance for you guys to network and talk to each other and learn, learn about what's happening uh, in teaching and research in energy on campus. Uh, the talk two weeks from now will be by Professor Tom Deich, who is a professor of sociology and environmental science and policy in Michigan State University. And he'll talk to us about energy conservation behavior and the behavioral wedge. It's something that we have not explored in much depth in the symposium before. So it should be very interesting. And it's, it's an area of uh, very core interest to myself because we, in, our, in my research group, we do a lot of uh, research uh, in that area. Our speaker today is Scott Gale. Scott is an adjunct professor of management at Rice University, and he's also the chief compliance officer and general counsel of Zaza Energy Corporation. Scott uh, is an author of three books, and one of them you can see uh, there is that, that's the cover right. of one of your books. Uh, and one of them is a textbook that is actually used by uh, students at Rice University. He teaches a course there every spring on uh, international energy development, which is also his international expertise, uh, including financial as well as legal aspects. Scott has been an all-in fellow in law and economics at the University of Chicago, where he received his Doctor of Law degree with high honors. Uh, and guess where he has his bachelor's degree from? From UT. So very, very pleased to have you here, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's wonderful to be back on campus here. And I thought I'd start by giving you a little bit of uh, my background to understand why I became interested in the natural resources curse, often called the oil curse. I went to, uh, as he pointed out, uh, law school at the University of Chicago, where I did a lot of work in law and economics, including a law and economics workshop with uh, Nobel laureates such as Ronald Coase and Gary Becker. And Gary Becker has written a lot about human capital and about the incentives that different types of laws and arrangements can create for individuals to invest in their human capital over the course of their life. And by human capital, he's referring to education, skills, <laughs> the sort of things that we're doing here at the university level. After graduating from law school, I went to work for Vincent and Elkins, a large law firm in Houston that specializes in energy issues. And I joined the energy section and started working on a number of these international projects in Africa, South America. After about five or six years there, uh, Occidental Petroleum, one of uh, our large clients at Vincent and Elkins, recruited me to be the legal manager for a number of their entities based in the Eastern Hemisphere. I moved to Dubai in 2001 and quickly found myself very much embroiled with uh, working with uh, foreign governments, trying to acquire petroleum rights for Occidental from the foreign governments, and then managing those relationships over time. This included the reentry into Libya following the uh, removal of sanctions there. And also, I became a director of business development for mergers and acquisitions in South America and Africa. And this is where my prior studies of human capital really came into play in the oil and gas industry as I started to travel to the nations of Africa, meeting with oil ministers and finance ministers, and spending a lot of time traveling around the region. Over the course of my career, I've been to 26 of the African nations, as well as just about all of the countries in South America, including places like uh, Suriname and French Guiana. And in the process of these travels, I try not to confine myself to business meetings and hotel rooms. I'd always try to leave 
a little early or stay a little bit longer so that I could travel around the country and talk to people who were not just in the energy business, but who were doing other things, and get a feeling for uh, the broader economics and the governmental situations in different countries. In terms of understanding the resource curse, at the highest level, I think it's about altering incentives, altering individual incentives. And I want to tell a story of a little village on the northwest coast of Madagascar called Anjajabi. Uh, this little village, it's hard to see with the, the laser pointer on this particular television set, but right off of Anjajabi, there is a very prospective petroleum block called uh, the Ampasandava block. It's owned 70% by ExxonMobil and 30% by an um, English company named Sterling. And this particular block has a tremendous um, oil and gas prospect on it called the Safaka prospect, which based upon seismic studies is estimated to hold more than a billion barrels of petroleum. What is a billion barrels of petroleum worth to a government or a contracting party I wrote up here on the board a uh, $16 billion net present value 10. And that $16 billion for the oil companies that would discover it and $16 billion for the government as well. Typically in, in most uh, developing nations before petroleum is discovered, you can assume almost a sort of 50-50 split between the value of the oil being produced uh, in any particular field with half of it going to the government and half of it going to the foreign contractors. But in any event, you can imagine $16 billion is a lot of money for a government that uh, uh, may have a fairly small number of, of people in, in the country and, and not a lot of other tax revenues available to it. I found myself in Anjajavi because I had uh, been working for a private equity fund after I left Oxy and had acquired a, a small royalty interest in this Ampasandava block in a transaction. And I knew that it was in a very remote part of the country and very environmentally sensitive. So I wanted to travel to that coastline and, and see what the situation was like there in the event that they did have a discovery. Um, after having a lot of difficulties with um, community relations in West Africa on different projects that I'd worked on with Oxy, I wanted to see what, what the landscape looked like there. So I, I flew out to Anjajavi from the capital of Madagascar, where they had just opened a new luxury hotel by a Reliant Chateau brand, which is a, a French hotel chain. And in the process of, of visiting some of the villages there and talking to people who are working at the hotel, I, I came across a very curious story. Um, one of the uh, workers, a massage therapist, spoke very good English, and I got to talking to him about um, uh, how he found himself working as a massage therapist at this uh, luxury hotel. And he said he had grown up in this little village, which is pictured here in the upper right-hand corner, and um, had gone to local schools and was planning to go to the capital to attend a uh, university. He was thinking about becoming a doctor or a nurse. And uh, as he was in high school at the time, uh, representatives of the ho hotel came to the village and gave a presentation about the hotel that was opening and how much they would be paying um, the employees at the hotel. And the hotel brought a, a, a basket, and they had different job titles in this basket. And, and anyone who was interested in working for the hotel, what they did was they went and they drew a job title out of the basket. And they were awarded that job, and they were trained in that job. So there were massage therapists, cooks, maids, waiters, guides, lifeguards, concierge, re reception workers, drivers. And so a, a large number of these, the village students from the high school were hired by the hotel to work in, in various positions. And it, it, it struck me that this was, uh, on a micro scale, what happens when large oil and gas companies show up and have $16 billion of revenues to spend in terms of local hiring and about how people who were destined to perhaps become business people or doctors or lawyers or work in other sectors or even fishermen in the local villages have their lives altered and diverted 
it, by the, the economic development that's taking place. So it's an example of how one person's life was changed, and it, it, it emphasizes how the impact on communities is not neutral when you have natural resource development or other economic development coming into a nation such as Madagascar. And the altering of incentives by these, these mega projects ends up affecting both the private sector and the public sector. What you have here is a great demand for employment, high paying employment, in many cases higher than people who had higher education degrees and are working in, in business jobs could possibly acquire developing their human capital. Instead, they go to work in rather lower skill jobs for higher pay while the natural resources are being developed. So it encourages less individual investment in human capital. And it also diverts people from other sectors into servicing the energy sector to try to participate in the uh, wealth that is being generated which is often a, a short-term thing because the human resources sector is a depleting sector. It's like a, a bank account that is being drawn down on a daily basis. It may take 20 years for the $16 billion to be removed from the earth, but after 20 years, it's gone and it's, it's not going to be replenished. On the government side, you have similar alterations in the incentive patterns. The government suddenly finds itself with $16 billion of new revenues from a billion barrel field and goes about trying to pr preserve and bolster its power position. <coughs> In many of these countries, they really do not have the democratic infrastructure that we're accustomed to here. So what you can see happening is in the public sector, the abundant government revenues are deployed to creating a lot of jobs for those political supporters of the administration, friends, family, others who are working. Uh, jobs are created that may not be necessary and people are put on the payroll. And this also diverts people from perhaps working in other sectors as well. People who might have worked in the medical sector, or the entrepreneurs end up going to work in um, fairly cush uh, government jobs where they don't really have to do a whole lot. You also have white elephant spending that goes on in these administrations where the administration will construct a dam or, or a real estate project that might generate short-term jobs but not, might not be the economical optimal use of the government revenues. So how have governments and oil and gas companies attempted to mitigate uh, this problem that occurs when you have oil discoveries in the developing world. There, there have basically been five different buckets of approaches taken. And, and they do relate to one another, and a lot of times they overlap. The first is improving governance, trying to get the government to properly manage its revenues that are coming from the oil and gas development. The second is bypassing governance, trying to create trust funds and ways to keep the money from flowing into a government that is itself not functioning properly. Then you have demands for local content and employment on the basis that if the oil and gas companies can hire more local people to work for them, they might be getting some skills and be developing their human capital. Fourth, increasing investment in higher education. As we pointed out before, we, in, in, these, in these situations where we have resource <coughs> developments happening, a lot of people are diverted from pursuing higher education and developing the sort of skills that might lead to development of other sectors in the economy. And then that also relates very closely to facilitating entrepreneurship and having a microfinance uh, type arrangements. So these are sort of five approaches to the resource curse. They relate very closely to one another. And I have my own particular approach 
that I've been advocating even from the time that I was at Occidental Petroleum, speaking at a lot of oil and gas conferences on behalf of the company and talking about these kinds of issues. And I wrote a law review article in the Energy Law Journal a few years ago about it that went into more detail. And that is a 1% royalty on all petroleum produced. And this could be applied to mining situations, a 1% royalty in all of the, the iron ore that's produced in a country, for example. So it could apply to other situations. But you take that royalty off the top from production and revenues so that both the government and the foreign oil and gas company, for example, share in the burden of funding this particular program. One half of the royalty would go toward facilitating microfinance programs. And as many of us are aware, microfinance has had quite a track record of success in the developing world. And this would continue to help bolster the microfinance environment in the developing country that is the subject of the resource uh, discovery. And then the second half would go to higher education lending. There are some programs now uh, that, are, that are matching through the internet um, students in the developing world who want to pursue higher education but who cannot afford it, where you can make contributions to their, to their loans and essentially become a lender for their higher education. But in most of the developing world, if you don't have the financial resources to pay for your own higher education, you're out of luck. There is no student loan program that you can go to to borrow funds. So this would be a way to fund in the developing world um, higher education lending programs to help uh, bolster the human capital element. Uh, taking these one by one and talking a little bit more about them, in, in the improving governance um, element, what you see when you do studies of different countries that have great natural resource discoveries is a divergence between countries that have good governance and natural resources and countries that have bad governance and natural resources. And countries like Norway, Canada, even Botswana that are regarded as having reasonably good governance, they don't succumb to the resource curse. They don't see their G GDP slow as a result of the discovery and in the years after the discovery. Whereas countries that have lower governance scores, such as Nigeria, Venezuela, Libya, for example, um, tend to have this resource curse and tend to have other sectors of their economy suffer um, while the resource is being developed. This is thought to be the result of inefficient public sector employment, where people who would otherwise be working in the broader economy are brought in as bureaucrats working for the government, but uh, relatively unproductively, sort of created jobs, and inefficient white elephant investment projects. When you get $16 billion dropped in your lap, uh, people go and they do some fairly silly things from time to time. I've spent a lot of time in Angola um, over the years. I, I first started going to Angola in 2004, not long after the Civil War there ended. And when I first was going to Angola, there really weren't even a lot of stores in downtown Luanda that were open. It was a, a fairly uh, slim um, commercial environment, a lot of boarded up buildings. And in a matter of a few years after the Civil War, due to two million barrels a day of oil production from several of these billion barrel fields that were discovered offshore, uh, the country's been transformed. They have a lot, of, a lot of money. There's a lot of commercial activity going on. But there's also a lot of white elephant spending. This is a, a city on the outskirts of Luanda called Kalamba that the government has spent um, $3.5 billion on. 750 buildings have been constructed. You can see them going off uh, for some distance in the pictures. Uh, there are a dozen schools that were constructed there, 100 retail units. But only 600 of the 20,000 apartments are paid for. It's a, a virtual ghost town uh, that the government has created. One of the reasons for uh, the lack of occupancy here is in Angola, many developing countries, there are no mortgages available. 
So even if you have a reasonably uh, good middle class job, you can't uh, go get a mortgage to, to purchase a condo or to purchase a home. You have to buy, pay for it in cash. So you have to save for many years to do that. I'm involved in a, in a business venture now where we're preparing to offer a mortgage project, product in Angola where the Angolan would have to put down 40% and, and the uh, funds from Europe and the banks from Europe would contribute the other 60% in a mortgage product that would help facilitate some buying. But for the time being, the government has overbuilt here and uh, as a large project that is not being utilized efficiently. In terms of improving governance, um, the, the efforts to improve it have focused on things like technical advice to the National Budget Office, anti-corruption and transparency, and of course corruption is a problem in, in many of these nations, as, uh, and, and it's, it's something that you, you probably read about in the papers if you've been following the energy industry, where oil and gas companies are often the subject of investigations over the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act because they might be alleged to have made payments to government officials in order to acquire concessions and other contracts in the country. They try to foster the rule of law. They try to ensure the integrity of elections. But despite these efforts being um, you know, legitimate and good intentioned, uh, the shortcomings of governance in, in much of the developing world uh, is to a certain extent by design to ensure that the current rulers remain in power. You see in, in many of these countries, it's not unusual for the administration to have been in power for uh, several decades. And for after the passing of the, the father, one of the sons will become the next president. And so there's a certain element of uh, lack of transparency, weak bureaucracies actually helping to um, prevent any, any uh, opposition from rising up and being able to dislodge those who currently hold the purse strings on the immense amount of wealth that's flowing through the coffers of the government. And it's enabled many of these administrations to divert hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, to their own Swiss bank accounts out of the country. So improving governance has been difficult to achieve in practice. That's led, um, in many cases, people to advocate bypassing uh, governance. Uh, just assuming that the government is not going to properly manage or efficiently deploy the resources that have been raised. So when people look at new energy projects, they talk about how they can create trust funds, for example, where some portion of the $16 billion that is flowing to the government can be diverted to a trust fund that is managed by independent trustees and funds programs like education, roads, and other forms of infrastructure that are vetted outside of the country. This was the case in the Chad Cameroon pipeline project. And uh, on the, this is Africa, and you can see that uh, Chad is in sort of north central Africa. There are some oil fields there that were discovered, and a pipeline was constructed from the oil fields down across Cameroon to deliver the petroleum to the Gulf of Guinea on the Atlantic Ocean. And one of the, one of the um, conditions to the World Bank making the loans that enabled the construction of this particular pipeline and the development of these resources was that you have a trust fund and you have a diversion of this wealth into the trust fund so that the proceeds can be properly managed and can be used to benefit the people of the country more broadly. While the government agreed to this to get the money from the World Bank to build the infrastructure, once you have the money sunk into the field and the petroleum is developed and the pipeline is built, there's no way to take it back. So at that point, the government and changed its mind and decided that it was going to not continue along with the trust fund approach. There are other ways that people have looked at uh, uh, managing this problem. Uh, direct payments, for example, is something that's been advocated in Ghana, 
where they recently had a billion barrel oil discovery in West Africa, with the idea being that some portion of the $16 billion, rather than it flowing to the government, would, would be divided individually among um, members of the population. Now, in, in a place like um, Alaska, where they actually do this, they have a petroleum fund in Alaska, and people who live there, citizens who've lived there for a certain period of time, um, annually get a check from this petroleum fund. It's basically their share of the petroleum production each year in the country. If, you, if you're able to track everyone and ensure uh, that they, they've, they have ID and that the, the right people are getting the payments, uh, that can work reasonably well, but in, in the developing world where identification is, is not as easy, it's something that they've struggled with. Also, like the trust fund, it's, it's uh, vulnerable to bypass. Uh, um, it's vulnerable to future government capture because um, the government might agree to it at the outset to help uh, the project get going, but once the project is going and the government is, is, is trying to... Uh, spend the money and it's looking at its budget and it realizes that all this money is flowing directly to the people and it can't uh, pay what it wants to pay for, you can see that the government has an incentive to potentially tip over the apple cart. And that could be the result of, uh, you know, different administration. It could be changed circumstances, uh, but it's something that is vulnerable um, in the future and is susceptible. There's also an interesting um, aspect that uh, governments often tout, and that is they, they want the oil and gas companies to employ local people and to buy locally. And that's, that's great in, in concept, but as I have um, uh, traveled around the world, it, you often see an interesting sort of paradox around this local hiring. And to put it in perspective here, this is a, a Schlumberger uh, slide. Um, I was at a conference in Namibia last year, and uh, the vice president of Schlumberger was up um, basically giving a recruiting uh, speech, you know, come work for Schlumberger, um, we'll, we'll take really good care of you, we'll pay you a lot of money, and, uh, and guess what, we'll, you'll be able to work in exciting places like London and Houston and Dubai. And it highlights this paradox of this local employment. The government thinks that when the oil and gas companies come in and they hire people to work for them, that they're learning skills that will be deployed locally within that country at some point, maybe in other businesses, maybe they're going to start businesses. But more often than not, what seems to happen is a lot of the best and brightest, most talented entrepreneur types are hired by the Schlumbergers of the world and they're, they're carted off to London or Houston, and they never, they never return to the country at all. And this, this happens, um, here's another slide from Schlumberger showing you know, how many people are working around the world in different offices. Um, so there, there's a bit of sort of cherry picking that goes on, and uh, it, it creates a bit of a paradox. Uh, my former employer, Occidental Petroleum, it had a big operation in Oman, and 80% and of the people who worked in the Oman office were local Omanis. But a, a lot of those um, personnel ended up back in, in Houston, for example, and um, maybe they stayed in Houston permanently and didn't go back to Oman or contributed in any way to the development of Oman afterwards. Um, other companies have similar um, advertising and its global hiring. Uh, it, Chevron, for example, talks about uh, having hired more than 5,000 people a year over the last five years, uh, most of whom were hired outside of the United States, and a lot of them, they don't stay in their, their local countries. So you can imagine there, there are people who might have become entrepreneurs, who might have become doctors in the local country, who get hired by Schlumberger, Oxy, Chevron, and they end up uh, living and working in, in London and Houston instead of contributing to the economy of the local country. One of the um, aspects of my particular proposal is trying to increase investment in education, trying to increase the human capital development of the local country. And, and education also has knock-on effects on good governance. To the extent you can create a more educated populace, uh, you have 
a greater demand for better governance. You, you start to do what the corrupt administrations really don't want to see happening, and that is a, a credible opposition. People who are self-sufficient, who are entrepreneurs making their own money, who are not dependent upon the salaries of a government job, for example. So to the extent you can increase investment in education and um, require people who take advantage of these programs to go back and work in the local countries, that's a, a much more desirable way to sort of from the ground up um, improve governance and avoid these sort of uh, problems of, of human capital drain within the country of people not investing in their education. Along the same vein, you have entrepreneurs in microfinance, where, as I was talking about earlier, microfinance has been very successful around, around the developing world. And to the extent you can expand the microfinance programs, again, you create entrepreneurs, you strengthen the other sectors of the economy that might be suffering as a result of the resource curse and help to uh, provide alternative routes for business creation and growth within the country. And again, back to the solution that I proposed, which is the modest royalty. It's, it's something that uh, really has relatively low cost to government. It's a small percentage point. It's, it, it isn't the same thing as trying to tell the government that half of their $16 billion is going to a trust fund that's going to be run by people who are outside of your country that can be viewed as offensive, for example. It can be viewed as loss of sovereignty. This is a local homegrown program that is a fairly small percentage. So because it isn't as costly to their budgeting plans, it, it's something that hopefully should be able to survive longer. It, it's a political... Uh, realism sort of approach to the problem rather than trying to divert all of the money or most of the money to successful causes you take just a little bit and and hope that, that can serve as a mitigator but a surviving mitigator also it, it does have some benefits for the government that's in power at the time um, you know it's always been said that a lot of these elites don't, don't look to the long term. Uh, they're very focused on the short term. But there are some short term benefits that are created by uh, a 1% royalty. So, for example, uh, having a 1% royalty like this, benefiting microfinance, higher education lending, is something that could Im improve the leaders standing in the international community. It could make the country uh, more eligible for international aid or, or loans because the government can point to something that it's trying to do and something that is there to try to <coughs> mitigate and balance the resource curse. And so the idea is that we're trying to steer between a government incentive to overturn the apple cart and capture all of the revenues. Um, while providing some benefits to the government as well. In terms of would 1% be enough to matter, let's do a little bit of a math exercise. So let's, let's not consider you know, the, the largest oil producing countries in the developing world like Africa and Nigeria, for example. Let's look at um, countries producing 250,000 barrels of oil per day and selling the oil at $70 per barrel on average. Um, e even that equates to about $6 billion per year in gross revenues. And you've got about uh, 39 countries on that list. It includes Gabon, Congo, Equatorial Guinea, for example. 1% of $6 billion is $60 million a year. Although 1% is a small number, $60 million a year um, divided equally between a higher education lending program and a microfinance program is a significant impact. 
So for example, in the $30 million microfinance program, some of the largest microfinance programs around the world right now have loan portfolios between $50 million and $200 million and reach more than 100,000 borrowers. $30 million per year injected into a microfinance program would, over the course of a few years, create significant institutions that could reach 100,000 uh, potential business people in a nation fairly easily. So the, it passes the test of being able to create a program on the microfinance side that is material and that matters without offending the government and hopefully making the government want to uh, capture all that money. On the higher education lending side, $30 million a year for higher education lending would fund approximately 1,000 international students from that country. Um, for example, uh, Angola right now has, say, 600 students who are studying in the United States. So 1,000 more international students studying abroad who, as a condition of the loan, have to agree to go back to their home country uh, would have a significant effect on the development of human capital within that country. And to the extent that local institutions of higher education can be developed, the numbers can be even greater based upon average sort of $2,000 per year cost of African universities, you might be able to reach 15,000 students a year locally with this sort of program. And if you consider 1% in a place like Angola or Nigeria where the petroleum production is 10 times this, you add another zero to those numbers and you get rather staggering um, potential for change in those countries. Or if, if the government thinks that's too much money, you have a half a percent royalty instead of a 1% royalty. Going back to the five different potential mitigators for the natural resource curse, the, the proposed royalty um, does have the potential to improve governance by creating a more educated electorate and also a more independent electorate to the extent that more people are able to work and fund their lives in the private sector rather than be dependent upon government jobs that could be taken away from them if they said something that disagreed with the administration. Uh, it um, also does bypass governance to a certain extent, right? It's a small bypass with a small amount of money, but the microfinance program and the educational lending program deliver funds directly to individuals who were business creators and students. With respect to local content and employment, microfinance, for example, is more likely to create homegrown employment. And to the extent people have more human capital development, they're more likely to uh, be able to make use of technology and other means to develop sectors in the economy. And of course, it, we're talking about increasing investment in higher education and incentivizing uh, people to invest in their human capital, to go out and acquire degrees and skills. And uh, by facilitating entrepreneurship, other sectors, cannibalization by the natural resource sector is mitigated. So again, what, I'd, what I've been advocating for some time is this royalty approach. And when you think about um, it being shared between the oil company and the government, there's a, a sort of a, a mutual sharing of it. If you're, if you're the oil and gas company, why would you agree to something like this? Well, if, if you're going to be in a country for 20 or 30 years, one of the risks that you face is, is the political. You know, will, that, will the government that awarded you the contract and still be there. If the government changes, will they respect your contract and continue to honor it in the future? Well, to the extent that you're able to avoid the resource curse and, and give opportunities to the community, uh, the, the more likely your contract is to survive 20 years, 30 years. The, 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 more, the less likely it is that you're going to be dealing with uh, people who are sabotaging your equipment or um, are creating environments that are dangerous for your workforce too. So from an oil company's perspective, uh, yeah, this is something that is, is not 
uh, draconian in terms of altering the economics of a project, but which um, you know, has independent justification in terms of decreasing the risk profile of doing business in a particular country. So I'll open the floor to questions now, and, and you can either ask about the natural resource curse or if you have any other general questions about international oil and gas, and I'll take those as well. Well, thank you for the presentation, Scott, and I would like to suggest and even beg that you take the investment in education equals improved government's uh, case, make that case about eight blocks south of here. Um, <laughs> and uh, with respect to the, the notion that, you know, there, that the, this makes a good investment in rural communities for oil companies, are, are these companies undertaking these programs or are you out on the, the uh, end of a long branch you know, making the case uh, and, and hoping for buy-in from management. Now, I'm, I'm on a long branch right now, but I'll tell you what the oil and gas companies are doing. They, they tend to do these sort of one-off projects. And I saw it when I was at Oxy and we were going into these countries working and developing. Um, they'll build a school or they'll build a health center. They'll provide some funds for it. But they tend to be one-off projects that... Um, Occasionally they work and occasionally they're beneficial, but a lot of times um, you go back in two or three years and the, the medical clinic is abolished because you know, the funds you provided them for a few years uh, ran out and, and it, it never took hold. So I, I think, I think the, the problem is the oil companies sometimes, they want to they wanna act like sort of a government and come in and, and pretend that they know what the community wants or what people really need there. And they go out and they think, well, I think you need a school, here's a school. Or I think you need a clinic, here's a clinic. But the advantage with this approach is that it, it puts the dollars directly in the hands of business creators and, and individuals who are, who are trying to get an education and advance their human capital and allows them to decide how to deploy it and what makes the most sense for their community rather than a, it's a bottoms-up approach rather than a top-down approach. Two unrelated questions. Um, Sorry, can you guys hear me? I have two unrelated questions. First, uh, I was just curious, the 1%, who's going to administer that money? And secondly, um, another alternative to the issue that you've brought up today, which we've seen in Mexico a couple decades ago, Venezuela a decade ago, and Argentina this past year, is the nationalization of uh, right. these companies. And, I mean, I know the stigma that comes along with that, but it's an issue that's worth discussing perhaps considering that a lot of governments find that to be the best way to develop uh, their local uh, workforce and so forth. So I'd just like to know what you okay, think. Okay, so there, there are two, two different questions. With respect to the, the management of the programs, that's something that, that needs to be addressed, uh, you know, in terms of the detailed execution of it. Microfinance programs in many cases could use existing microfinance institutions. Uh, there are a lot of microfinance institutions now that are out there in these countries, and what you could do is say, look, we're gonna, you're going to be the beneficiary of another $30 million a year, and we want you to use your existing infrastructure to deploy it uh, properly. Um, even if a country didn't have that particular institution in place, um, you could, you could get one of the neighboring countries' institutions to sort of expand and, and execute the project there. Higher education lending is a bit of a trickier situation. If you go to my Law Review article, I, I do talk about this Internet-based uh, developing world higher education lending platform where you know, anyone in this room could log on and, and review videos and stories of, of different potential students who have dreams of becoming doctors, lawyers, business people around the world who are seeking funds for their higher education. And, and you have this Internet platform where capital is deployed to those sorts of people. So that's, that's a promising approach. And um, you know, rather than deploying capital from the people in this room, 
you could deploy capital from the government and do it in a, in a more localized situation using a similar kind of approach there. Um, on the nationalization front, I mean, that's been more of a problem in, in South America for political reasons than it has been in Africa and elsewhere. You know, what, what you have with governments is, in, in most of the developing world, they're looking to foreign oil and gas companies for um, the technology and capital to be able to develop resources. Uh, now, I'll, I'll point out that when you, when you do exploration, okay, uh, most national oil companies don't want to be engaging in exploration because it's a very risky game. A deep water exploration well is typically $100 million or more. So if um, your government, you're looking at, at drilling an exploration well, where the chance of finding oil may be one in six, one in five, and you have a 80% or higher chance of losing your $100 million, most... Um, uh, governments are not interested in, in taking that kind of risk. So you have um, very sophisticated um, international oil companies who come in and are willing to take that risk to turn $100 million into $16 billion. Uh, by, and what they do, they manage it through portfolio by having you know, many wells being drilled in many different places around the world, whereas most national oil companies are more concentrated and they're, they're reluctant to take that risk and then a lot of times you have the most sophisticated technology being deployed from the international oil companies in terms of, of how you drill wells, how you develop the reservoir, model the reservoir over time. So nationalization, um, if, it's, if it's an oil field that is sort of slow and steady and doesn't require uh, you know, any, any great technology, you know, that might make sense. But um, I think even Venezuela is has suffered in terms of the amount of production it's been able to sustain in the wake of nationalization. Um, and I know in, in Ecuador, Occidental Petroleum had a, had a pretty significant oil field there that was uh, nationalized by the government. And um, you know, what we saw fairly uh, shortly afterwards is you saw production levels declining you know, pretty dramatically as they weren't able to go around and maintain the pressure of the reservoir to, to continue to have the sort of production. Uh, we had a lot of sophisticated computer models um, that were used to, to balance a reservoir. So um, it's one of those things that I don't think is, I think it has more political benefits for the country than, than economic benefits. And, and then you get into the, the more complex situation of national oil companies that are leaving their, their borders to go out and, um, and act as international oil companies, like um, the, the Chinese and Indian national oil companies. But that's sort of a different, uh, a different story. Uh, thanks so much, Scott, for this talk. Um, I just had two quick questions. Um, one, um, obviously, oil ministers around the world, many have been, have been educated in America's top schools, and they are well aware of this problem and talk about it all the time. Um, curious, if, have you encountered any oil ministers from a developing country who, or, or, or bureaucrats in general who have been able successfully politically to slow walk development of oil reserves? In other words, not turn on the spigot of everything at once, but conscientiously slow the development process so that it doesn't overheat the economy um, as we all know it always does. Um, obviously, that's politically very difficult. And number two, um, it seems pretty clear, and, and you kind of mentioned this, but uh, maybe explicitly the tie between uh, the security of the regime and, um, and distribution of oil resources. And, and I think a great example is what's happening in the Persian Gulf right now. Um, I, was, I lived there for many years, and, um, you know, between 2007 and 2010, that part of the world, they were very, you know, Saudi, UAE, they were very interested in opening their economies, opening their media sectors, and all that now is rolling backwards because of the Arab Spring, and it's now about distributing resources as quickly as possible mm -hmm. to ensure that there is no repeat of the Arab Spring in that part of the world. And I'm curious, is, um, you know, to what extent is the legitimacy of the regime, whether it's a dictatorship or, or, or a so-called democracy, linked to um, the the event the uh, the resource curse. How bad is the resource curse? I mean, in other words, you know, do you, do you think there's a tie there in terms of governments that spend less money, keeping themselves in power, suffer less from the resource curse? Sorry for the long-winded question. Okay, well, let's take the um, the first question, which was about uh, whether or not oil ministers and governments 
want to slow walk the development of the resources. In my experience of dealing with um, countries, it's the exact opposite. Um, they, want, they want the well now. They want to build into the contract very short timelines for how, how long you have to, to execute the development once you have a discovery. And, and some of that, I think, is just um, the, the product of, of wanting to, to generate the revenues uh, for the economy as soon as possible. Now, oil and gas companies don't oppose that either, right? Because if once you've spent $100 million in a well and you start spending money in a project, in your economic model, your debt present value to the company is increased um, by acceleration and, and decreased by um, more slow developments. And, um, but, but sometimes you do get into uh, disagreements on developments where it's a question of how much you produce on a daily basis over you know, over time, what that, what that profile looks like. You, know, you can have um, a production profile that starts, you know, you go high and, and it drops down kind of like that, or you can have a production profile that's, you know, a little more steady like that. And sometimes the, the lower initial production can result in, in, in more net present value to the oil and gas company uh, because if you, if you produce the field too hard, too quickly, you can deplete the reservoir of pressure and affect uh, and end up getting, recovering less, a lower percentage of the original oil in place. So I have had disagreements with the government about the development approach where the government's wanting something that is, you know, fast and quick. Um, we don't care whether we're going to be producing oil in, in 15 years or how much is going to be. You know, that's someone else's problem. Whereas uh, an oil company may even have a, may have a longer time horizon than the government because they want to maximize NPV. They've got economic models, and 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 we're, we're talking about you know what's the NPV 10 of the project for a company and its shareholders long term. You don't want to uh, blow it out early. Now, the second question again. Yeah, I think that goes back to the, I don't know whether it's autocratic or non-autocratic, but um, the governance issue that I was talking about, I do cite a couple of articles there where, where they look at you know, the political risk rankings in, in different countries, and they find that the higher the political risk ranking, um, when you couple that with natural resources, the greater the oil curse. So th there is a strong correlation there. Um, and in, in the Persian Gulf, um, you, have, you have interesting examples. Uh, for example, um, Dubai didn't have a whole lot of oil. And as a result of that, um, I guess it was Sheikh, Sheikh Rashid, who was the, the Sheikh in Dubai, when um, he realized that his oil wasn't going to last forever, um, went around and, and created the Jebel Ali Free Zone, um, created an airport, an airline, Emirates Airlines, and uh, did a lot to diversify the economy and make it a, a place that uh, didn't, didn't stand on the sole leg of oil that was eventually going to run out, but had a, a multiple uh, sector economy functioning on many cylinders. And that's, that was very successful. Um, now, someplace like Saudi Arabia that really didn't, um, didn't do that, it, 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 its um, economy rises and falls with the price of oil. In, in how much they could produce. And I can tell you when I was in, in Saudi Arabia in 2001, 2002, working on a, on a big project there for Oxy, when oil prices were $17 a barrel, um, they were hurting. They were, they were really hurting. They were borrowing a lot of money. They were on an unsustainable debt um, uh, pattern trying to continue to provide uh, essentially welfare payments to a huge percentage of the population. And, uh, but for oil prices rising um, quite dramatically in Saudi Arabia, uh, you, yeah, it, was, it was unsustainable what they were doing there because they had no other um, economic uh, development going on. So I, I think that those are a couple of, of concrete examples and um, are pretty interesting. Uh, okay. uh, yes, I had a question. It was pertaining to the cultures of the countries as far as education goes. Have, as far as people 
like in Saudi Arabia and Africa, they have different ideals about tradition and uh, modernization. And there's a lot of tradition in these countries, and so when someone becomes educated, you know, as in the upper level education, college and on, or even doctors, um, the standard of living, living the, the country they come from is, is less than ours. So when they come to America, it's, I, I found that it's like they, they want to stay over here because the standard of living is higher here. What, what would be the solution as far as, you know, you want them to improve their country and go back and improve theirs and bring up a higher standard of living? What, what's your answer just to a question like that? Right. I mean, I, I think... If you're going to have one of these higher education lending programs, there has to be a condition to go back um, to their country and, and contribute there for some number of years. They can't stay. They can't move to someplace else. Um, but at the same time, I will say that in terms of traveling around the world, you, you, do, encounter, you do encounter plenty of national pride elsewhere, too. Like um, Angola in particular, I could say that I know a lot of Angolans who um, were living in London in the United States and have gone back to Angola to start businesses there because uh, they want to be home. So hopefully between those two, you'd be able to manage that problem. Very interesting idea, Scott, on the one percent royalty. I think I'm, I'm certainly sold. I have uh, one question. How much you mentioned the 600 number of uh, Angolan nationals studying internationally? How much do you think that is a product of lack of money or funding? Because presumably there are a lot of Angolan nationals who are making a lot of money, either by working at, with the government or through other channels. So how much do you think the lack of international students from Angola is because of lack of funding? And to put the question differently, if you, were, if you created this new fund with the 0.5% royalty, uh, how much will the take-up be? given that you still will have the opportunity to make a lot of money in a whole variety of jobs? Uh, taking the first question, keep in mind that 600 was just Angolan studying in the United States. There, there are far more uh, Angolan studying, for example, in, in uh, England, uh, Portugal, um, for example. And so I do think that, um, but the, and, and, if, and if they are able to afford it, they do it. I mean, I I think uh, there, there's a fairly large number of wealthy people in Angola, uh, business people and government people who, who all um, will, are educated in Europe and the United States. And the second question? How much what the take-up will be if you created this fund? Uh, there will still be a lot of jobs in Angola. So what is the incentive really to do, have, get higher education? What's the incentive? You, even without that education, you have access to Jobs. Well, and that's and that's part of that's the problem, right? I mean, it's the question of, of whether or not um, you can overcome the the pull, the the altering of the incentive to go and and invest in higher education and a career when you could get money now at, at, without having to have any particular skills that is um, potentially life changing for a lot of people. So that's that's part of the part of the problem. But I think what you what you do by creating, by lowering, the barrier to access to higher education, you educate you, you give people the opportunity to go abroad and and develop their skills and reach their dreams without having to worry about how to pay for it. And and hopefully that'll help. There. Um, I don't think it was working. In, I think that was Africa and the Middle East. Um, Could you just comment on Namibia and Mozambique for oil? Okay, just generally. Um, well, um, which place would you go to? <laughs> well, they're they're very different um, in terms of of the opportunity profile there. In in Namibia, there. Yeah, in Namibia there is no current oil production there right now, and they just had their first oil and gas uh, summit, which I, which I attended and spoke at in August of last year, because it's believed that there's an Angola play called the Subsalt play, which extends 
from Angola down into northern Namibian waters, okay? And that's what oil and gas companies are pursuing there, including British Petroleum, which has taken several positions in Namibia. Now, the first couple of wells drilled pursuing this have failed. They've been dry holes, but sometimes it takes um, several wells to figure out how things work. But it's essentially the same type of oil and gas play that, that Cobalt and Marisk have discovered in Angola, called Subsalt, and which uh, a lot of companies have in Brazil. Uh, Maersk, Maersk, the the, um, the Danish, Danish company. Oh, they're in oil also. They're in oil also, and and Cobalt is a Houston-based uh, company that is uh, in the Memorial City area of Houston that uh, discovered a large, probably billion barrel field in Angola with this new play, sort of to the south, and and the expectation is that 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 same type of discovery potential exists in northern Namibian waters. And, but it hasn't been proven there yet. Now, on the Mozambique side, you have Mozambique on one side and Madagascar on the other side, and there's a channel between them. And the Mozambique side, you have Anadarko discovering a huge multi-TCF gas fields on the Mozambique side. So it's all about LNG and natural gas in Mozambique. The expectation is that as you move across the channel to Madagascar and to the Seychelles, the waters of the Seychelles, the archipelago that exists off of Mozambique, that you're going to get into oil rather than natural gas because of the, uh, the geology, the, the depth of the burial of the hydrocarbons. Uh, they haven't been uh, buried as deep and cooked as much as the gas toward Mozambique. And that's why Exxon has taken that big position on the uh, west coast of Madagascar. And the only reason that hasn't been drilled yet is the um, political situation in Madagascar where you had a non-democratic regime change. Uh, radio disc jockey uh, basically toppled the democratically elected president in, a, in a, uh, an unfriend, uh, unfriendly situation that uh, caused Exxon to declare force majeure. But sitting out there is one of the largest exploration prospects in Exxon's inventory, that Safaka prospect. And um, you can have more uh, similar prospects like that in the Seychelles um, to the north as well. All right. Thank you so much, Tom.